Now, if there's one thing you ought to know about me, it's that I love me some good old-fashioned doom. All of it. There's nothing like kicking back and slaying some good old-fashioned man-on-demon violence, you know? Colorful 2.5D hell. Just hits me right in the feels, you know? I also love Classic Doom's modding scene. Even after 30 years of this game, people still find ways to make this game new and exciting, with plenty of gameplay mods and maps that completely flip the way the game is supposed to be played. Which brings me to the topic of today's feature-length film. Now, there's one of these mods that I don't think gets enough credit, and that mod is Ashes 2063, which is so good that it's almost insulting to call it a mod. It's a post-apocalyptic total conversion mod that turns the game into what is essentially a playable Mad Max movie straight out of the 80s. What's even more impressive than that is the fact that this mod was effectively created by two or three dudes, chief among them being Vostyok, with some help from some other lads on the modding scene like Reformed Joe, with an accompanying soundtrack done by Primeval. And oh boy, when we get to that soundtrack, let me tell you, oh, Oh, it's just great. Anyways, it's fast, brutal, and extremely fun to play. If any of that even remotely caught your attention, there will be a link down in the description of the game's mod DB page. It's completely free, it doesn't even require a copy of Doom to play. Everything just kind of zipped up in this nice folder, and all you need to do is launch one of the executables to get it working. Simple as that. Anyways, if you're still here, then here's your one courtesy spoiler warning as well. I will be going into great detail to discuss this game's plot, even if it is just a vessel to carry you from place to place to shoot stuff up at times. So if you don't want spoilers, then uh, click off this video and play the game yourself. Oh, and also, remember to come back this time. Okay, so let's just get right into the meat and potatoes of this adventure. For the duration of my entire playthrough, I played on the Survival difficulty, which is the second hardest in the game. The difficulties are pretty standard, except for Survival. What Survival does is increase all forms of damage, both your enemies and your own. It also cuts the ammo pickup gains in half, meaning that you generally have less ammo floating around than you would on other difficulties. This makes the secret caches hidden around every level incredibly important, as the game leaves you with very little in terms of ammo and healing supplies if you're not actively searching out for it. Apocalypse difficulty I don't really want to touch on, so I'm just going to briefly go over it. What it does is increase the amount of enemies in each level on top of increasing their health, which generally turns the game into a bit of a slog. To compensate for this, though, it does give you some more ammo to play with, so you're not constantly running dry. Anyways, though, survival difficulty it is. Welcome to the tutorial level. The only reason I'm doing it is because you can get some extra supplies with the first map if you decide to go through this, which is actually pretty helpful. The tutorial really only teaches you the bare essentials, and some of these things are actually pretty useful to learn, like the fact that these random decoration items, like these boxes and trash bags, can have random items in them. Those items usually being junk, which is nice since junk is your currency in this game, but we'll be talking about that more when we get to the first social hub. It also acquaints us with the importance of the game's most valuable weapon, the crowbar. And you might think that it's just some standard melee weapon, but it can be so much more with a little practice. On this difficulty, it's very good at taking out most non-firearm-wielding enemies. Case in point, these pink cannibal bastards who can take quite a few gunshots, or one heavy attack and one light attack from the crowbar. This makes the crowbar invaluable for early maps so you can save on ammunition. This level also introduces us to another one of the game's most major additions to the GZ Doom engine, the motorbike. To be honest, this thing kinda handles like ass. The thing really feels like you're constantly driving and turning in mud or some shit. At the very least, the roads that you have to drive on are usually pretty solid and open, making this pretty forgiving. Once we reach the end of the tutorial map, we're dropping to the first map and it's an even better introduction to the game. I should probably talk about your other starting weapon, now that I'm actually shooting people. Your main pistol for most of the game is this stumpy looking 45 caliber revolver. Despite the fact that the name would imply that it's only a 45, it's surprisingly good at taking out the lower tier human enemies, and even some of the mutants, like these little bastards, the bug dogs. They're effectively stand-ins for the imps with their piss-weak melee attack and their projectile attack. They can still be easily dispatched with a single crowbar attack or a shotgun shell once you get your hands on the shotgun. And speaking of that shotgun, it's very nice, just a nice FPS shotgun, no notes. You can find one in this secret where you can use this cash register, or you can get one off of a dead shotgunner. Speaking of the human enemies, they come in three flavors, at least in this episode. The 45 revolver grunts, who, you guessed, they carry the same 45 that we start with. The 9mm grunts, who carry the 9mm autoloader, which is a weapon that is about as generic as it looks, and is really only useful in these early maps. And of course, the shotgunners, who carry shotguns, obviously. These guys usually only drop a couple of bullets, so practicing careful aim is very important. The main goal of this map is to find this here radio inside of a storage room that's been locked with a blue keycard. And speaking of the maps, they're all very good. They flow together very nicely. Each one of the major battles in each of these maps usually has some kind of alternate path to enter into, it's great. I should also finally talk about the music, and if you've seen any of my other videos, including my first two videos which were literally on these games, then you should know that the soundtrack in this mod is absolutely fucking brilliant. I'm not even going to talk about it, I'm just going to play a clip of it. Now that is some good shit. Anyways, once we get the radio, we can peel out of the warehouse, clearing out this massive crowd of bug dogs and raiders packed into this last area. We can also go into this back room and use this bullet farm machine, which we can use to produce some more boxes of 45 ammo. This gives me an opportunity to talk about the next thing that this game does incredibly well, which is its environmental design. Every place feels lived in and real, at least as well as one can achieve with a 30-year-old game engine. The game is also packed full of little references and easter eggs, for example, the bullet farm machine, or the numerous Mad Max for your road posters that are all over the fucking place. 
or the various references to Doom or other video games. Honestly, I could just keep going, there are that many of them. Anyways, once we leave the warehouse, we hop on our bike and hit the road. Our plan is to head over to a small settlement where a trader might be able to take that radio off our hands and get us some easy cash. The only problem being that our ride is running low on gas and the closest place where we can refuel is deep into gang territory. So our plan is to strike at night so we park up and wait for night to fall. When the next level actually starts, we're fiddling with the radio when we get some bizarre static that confuses our lead character. If you thought the last level was good too, then well, you ain't seen nothing yet, son. Seriously, this map is just awesome. It takes place around this old abandoned truck stop which has been curiously taken over by a horde of mutants, not the human gang members like we were expecting. I suppose this is a better outcome since we can easily take out almost all the mutants with our crowbar. We can also partake in the first properly large battle in the game here in this parking lot area. We can also find this baseball cap which is our first collectible with... NMA embroidered on it. NMA is and no mutants allowed? Jesus, that one's rather obscure. At least to someone who's more of a Bethesda Fallout enjoyer. I don't know, man, the form is literally older than I am. Regardless, after we clear out the back parking lot, we can finally grab the key to the end of this small convenience store, which has the only human enemies in the entire map holed up in it. Once we clear it out, we can carve a path through the final section of the map. To actually get the fuel we need, we'll have to get the gold security key, which can be found in this radio station. Remember those numbers, they'll be important in about an hour or two of gameplay. Once we finally get into the warehouse with the gas, we get predictably ambushed by a small army of mutant cannibals and bug dogs. And they're also complemented by a large napalm cannon wielding mutant with a ton of health. You could just leave the level without killing any of these guys, if you're a fucking beta. But not me, I took the time to crowbar all these guys except for the napalmer, I just dumped a bunch of ammo into him. After we clear out the mutants, we can head over to the wall, which is the previously mentioned social settlement with the trader guy that the scavenger was talking about. The scaver talks about him being borderline gangster, which I suppose is mildly accurate considering the pimp coat. He offers to take the radio off our hands for a hundred bucks, which is a pretty decent deal. I don't really use junk for anything in this first episode since it can only really be used for buying things. And I already get plenty of ammo from finding secrets and just saving ammo with the crowbar. While we're still here at the wall, we can also talk to the barkeep who happens to be a Snake Plissken lookalike and he offers us a job, on top of the one that Smiley gave us, which is to deliver an expensive briefcase computer to someone named Riggs who lives deep into the city. The barkeep wants us to help clear out the dam, which is currently being inhabited by a small army of raiders. We'll be working with one of his associates named Fortune, who sets up a small wager for us to take bargain. If we can reach the center of the dam faster than her, we can get our hands on an upgraded pump shoddy, which sounds like a pretty good deal to me. After agreeing to this, we can head to the next proper map, which is probably one of the only levels between both episodes that I don't really care for. It's short and not terribly hard, it's just a gauntlet of raiders and bug dogs to contend with, nothing too hard for us in this stage. I suppose this map does provide us with some extra loot, which is still much appreciated. Once we're done clearing out the dam, Fortune finally shows up and we can claim our prize, that being this old beaten up pump action shotgun with a darker paint job. I honestly couldn't tell you what exactly changed between these two shotguns. Maybe the new one does more damage, which would be kind of pointless in this difficulty since enemies can still go down from one blast from the normal one, but but it's honestly whatever. Still looks pretty cool though. After we bid our farewells to each other, we can hop on our bike and head out of town, bound for the city. The next map is Highway Holocaust, and thankfully this one is the only bike heavy level in the entire game. Thankfully, the roads are wide enough to make turning not completely horrible. Still, the speed that you can pick up on this thing is pretty good, so overall it's actually pretty fun to ride. There are also plenty of little side areas off the main road, like this junkyard with these crash trucks that somehow count as a secret for some reason. Once we actually reach the city, the level picks up tenfold. Also, when we get off the bike, we just leave it there in this random parking lot. Remember this, because in the second episode, the bike is just magically back. Whatever, the next part of the map takes place in this police station, and like mentioned earlier, this is where the level picks up quite a bit. In my opinion, the game just works better in smaller urban environments. After we clear out the police station, we have a small section in this adjacent building so we can get to the final part of the map, which is this old abandoned train station. Once we carve a path through the final group of raiders, we jump down into the subcaverns. The subcaverns are probably my favorite level in the entire game. They're surprisingly non-linear with a ton of different pathways to explore. Our main goal is to find a spare key to get our way into Michonne Circle, which is the settlement where Riggs is holed up in. This level can actually be pretty spooky at times since the first half of the map is relatively sparse with its enemies. Eventually, the subcameras are just crawling with mutants of all shapes and sizes though, including these new gas bag spore guys who explode into a shower of toxic viscera that can hurt you if you're too close. They can still be easily dispatched with a couple of spare 45 rounds or a shotgun shell if you're up close. Now, I'm just gonna say this off the bat here, there's a secret exit in this map, so if you don't want to have the secret level spoiled, then skip to the timestamp up on screen now. Still here? Well, to get to the secret area, we need to go through this other side passage where we have to do some parkour through a highly irradiated room to grab the yellow keycard. After that, we just have to go through the rest of the map like so until we reach this area here. Now, normally you'd have to go through an area and get ambushed by a ton of mutants, but since we got the yellow key, we can unlock this side passage here where we can turn on the gas and subsequently burn down these vines that were blocking the exit to the secret map. And once we flood this final arena, we can get to the Temple of the Dollar, and this is probably in my top three for the entire episode. 
It's set in this carcass of this old mall, and it's just stuffed with raiders. Nearly a hundred of them in total, most notably in this section with the food court, and I suppose this gives me an opportunity to talk about the game's combat. To say the least, it's incredibly satisfying. I figured that that should have gone without saying since I talked about how much this game is, like, you know, ridiculously good earlier. But even then, the combat is just so much more fluid than you'd expect, somewhat akin to blood rather than doom, with a large emphasis on crouching to avoid gunfire since most human enemies can actually fire what seem to be projectile bullets instead of normal hit scans. Meaning that yes, you can actually dodge them by crouching or just strafing out of the way, at least from further ranges, up close it's still kind of a crapshoot. But on some occasions, you'll see bullets whiz past your field of view as you dart for another piece of cover which is really quite intense at times. I don't know, maybe I'm just looking too far into this, but this is always what the game's combat seem to be striving for. To actually get out of this joint, we need to flip the power on inside of this casino, which will open a bunch of stores around the map, revealing several groups of mutants and cannibals that were previously locked away. At this point, we could just leave, but I take the time to find this elaborate secret area which requires us to backtrack all the way to the start of the level. And what do we find there? Well, we find Max's interceptor, as well as his iconic sawed-off shotgun just sitting in the trunk of the car. This is the only opportunity to pick up a double-barreled shotgun in the entire game, so if you miss this level, then you'll be shit out of luck. Honestly, this thing is actually pretty damn fun to use, even if its spread is just horrible. Now that I have it, we can conveniently stumble our way into Michonne Station, which has an entrance inside of this random mall. Our only real goal here is to talk with Riggs, but this area is still a fully functioning social hub. It's got a bar tended to by a woman named Violet. We'll get to know her more later in this game's sequel. There's a chem dealer, a weapons merchant, and even a small mutant fighting pit, which I sadly didn't end up betting in. Regardless, Riggs is pretty close to the entrance, and he'll accept the briefcase computer. As a reward, he can either offer us some metal armor or a bunch of cash. But there is a third option. If you pester him about crafting weapons, then he can actually work on our 9mm machine pistol, a weapon that I somehow forgot to mention. It's a pretty damn good submachine gun. A good old Mac 10 even though it's spread as dog shit. It still makes up for that though in volume of fire. Anyways, Riggs can upgrade it with a silencer as well as giving it a faster reload speed, which is helpful since it won't alert on our enemies now. Stealth attacks can actually be pretty useful since you can cut down the amount of enemies in an area without actually alerting any of them. Regardless, he also has a job for us. He wants us to find the Spire, a large radio tower at the center of the city where he believes that the signal for the woman's voice came from. At least I now know that I'm not the only person who heard that. Regardless, after I dick around in town for a little longer, I decide to head to the surface where we're greeted by a fiery red sky. Once we emerge into the heart of the city, the sky is a burning, fiery red. We just so happen to emerge at the worst possible time during a harsh rad storm. So, even being outside now causes us to gain rads. I should probably talk about the radiation systems since I've neglected to for most of this video now, and in reality it's not that big of a system to dive into. It's represented by this little bar in the bottom left of the screen attached to our health and armor display. And also, this has got to be one of the coolest UIs I've ever seen in a Doom mod. It's nicely detailed without being unnecessarily cluttered or distracting. It's also very Pip-Boy reminiscent, which I like a lot. Back to radiation, though. If it's in the green, you're fine. If the meter is in the yellow, then you'll start to take some damage, and if the meter is in the red, well, you're basically fucked. There are very few places in the game where you can actually attain a large amount of rads, so this is really never that problematic, all things considered. After we clear out a small section of apartments, we reach this sort of bar slash restaurant here, which is just stuffed with raiders, and it's a good time. I make good use out of the 9mm machine pistol that I've upgraded, as well as the double barreled shotgun, since it's mostly human enemies here. Oh, and the soundtrack in this level is baller as fuck, as per usual. Once we've grabbed the silver key, we have to trek back through the apartments and then go up to one of the higher floors where we can jump this gap into an office space which is filled with a bunch of mutants, including one of the larger mini-boss kinds. Oh, and we can finally get our hands on the last weapon of the game, the Junker Musket, and it's a decent enough weapon. I'll talk about it more when we get into the episode too. I make good use out of it in this collapsed tunnel where I'm forced to do some skeet shooting on these trash goblins who I refuse to learn the name of and I will instead stick to coming up with a new name every single time I refer to them. They jump around and have an annoying melee attack, so really they're just more of a nuisance if anything. Once we clear a path through the tunnel, we come into this giant parking lot arena where I actually use some of the stems that I've been collecting for the past five or six maps. I pop a regen and a purge stem. The regen stem is pretty self-explanatory, and the purge stem is basically super right away, which is nice since the entire fight is outside in the radiation. Still though, it's just us versus a horde of mutants with two mini-bosses accompanying them. After we clear out the radio station, we can find a yellow keycard which allows us to open one of the elevators and jump into the end of the level. After climbing down for what seems like an eternity, we can finally reach the bottom, arriving in some kind of military installation deep below the surface. The entrance is locked, but if you remember all the way back in map 2, we heard the voice over the radio saying a number. 1221. If we punch in that number into the keypad, then the door magically opens. Looks like whoever is broadcasting that message has to be down here somewhere. The base itself is crawling with mutants, as well as these ghost bastards called haunts. They've got a purple projectile attack that can deal a lot of damage, but still, since it's a normal projectile, you can whack them to death with a little bit of practice and patience. Once we reach the center of the base, we can find this large computer room with as a terminal in the center of it. The terminal houses the Athena AI, which is what sent out the signal originally kickstarting this whole crusade in the first place. 
Its role in this game is rather small, since it only exists in this one level, but it still mentions that there was apparently someone else who came to the base before us. Someone who classed themselves as a general, which forced Athena to grant him complete access to all of its files. Athena still needs to finish its directive, though, which requires us to find this general fellow who may still be on the premises. In short, he's not, but this giant mutated warlord prick with a minigun and a flamethrower is. And he's our final boss. He's even got this little goon who's attached to him who throws pipe bombs, which is kind of funny. When the little guy dies, the big goon goes into a sort of rage mode, and I decided to just drug myself out of my mind and dump everything I have into him. Eventually, though, he finally goes down, and when he does, the building collapses around us, and we're crushed beneath god knows how many tons of rubble. Still, though, we miraculously survived this since we're the main character. In the end, though, this mod was an absolute blast. Truly one of the greats of the Doom modding scene. But if you thought this episode was good, then, oh, you just wait. Okay, before we can actually go to the sequel, I figured that I should take time to talk about the first episode's expansion since it came out between the two major episodes. It's rather short, so I'm just going to squeeze it in between the two major acts of this feature-length film. Not to detract from the overall quality of Dead Men Walking, because it's actually pretty damn fun. For a short, 50-ish minute expansion, the developer did a pretty damn good job. Oh, and they even got Primeval back for the music, which definitely sweetens the pot on this one. Anyways, let's just jump right into it, and as per usual, we'll be playing on the survival difficulty. The expansion starts with us getting jumped by a gang of goons. They steal our wheels, beat the shit out of us, and leave us in a ditch with nothing but our crowbar, so in reality we'll be A-OK -okay since we have this bad boy. Once we crawl out of the ditch, we can huff it over to the nearby gas station where we can heal up and talk to this fine old gentleman. He informs us that the local gang in these parts happens to be the Rippers, and we'll get to know them a little bit more later. After we're done talking with him, we can head deeper into the town. For the first half of this map, we'll only be going up against mutants and cannibals, which is good since we're strapped for ammo, healing items, and, well, basically everything. This fruits map, though, doesn't hold any punches when it comes to enemies, though, since we get jumped by quite a large selection of mutants, including the trash goblins in this clothing store. We can also get a surprising amount of firepower on this map, probably because this expansion is, you know, only 50 minutes long. Case in point, this sawed-off shotgun in the secret here. Shortly after that, we can get our hands on a 9mm machine pistol in this warehouse filled with all sorts of treasure. Oh, and mutants. Plenty of mutants. Once we get out of that warehouse, we have to clear out another small army of mutants before we crawl into these underground areas where the game gets all spooky, especially since it reintroduces the haunts here. Seems pretty early they place a couple of these goons in the first level, but like skid earlier, they can still be crowbarred without any hassle. Anyways, once we get out, we can find this helpful fellow who says there's an entire encampment of rippers camped out just ahead, which is quite the roadblock. Now that I have a chance to talk about these guys, I suppose I should, you know, talk about them. Now, you might think that these guys are just reskins, and well, uh, you'd be mostly right. The reskins are pirate themed though, which is actually pretty nice. Also, I forgot to mention, I'm playing the Enhanced Edition of Ashes, which came out around the same time that Episode 2 did, which retextures some things to make things more in line with Episode 2. I'm bringing this up now because in the original release of Dead Man Walking, the Rippers were the same ones as the base game, but in the re-release they've been changed into the aforementioned pirates. The only guy that faced any sort of major change is the 9mm Grunt, who now carries two pistols instead of one, making him only marginally more threatening. The rest of this map is spent fighting these clowns, and this is where the level gets at its peak again, mainly because we're back to fighting human enemies in a somewhat close approximation of a real place in a 30-year-old game engine. Like this fast food joint, or this government building thing here. In the end, when we clear the place out, we end up in this bunker beneath the, um, uh, the... The, the fucking place with all the beds and shit, I don't know what it's called. Once we arrive, we're greeted by a bunch of goons and a man named Baker. He tells us that the Rippers are based out of the power plant that's just a short run from here. Unfortunate for us, the best way to get to the power plant is via the sewers. I suppose it was only a matter of time before the game put us through a sewer level, though. Thankfully, before we go, I can at least get my hands on another SMG silencer, which is certainly nice. Once we leave the bunker, we exit out into the sewers and start following the radium trail. True to Baker's words, the place is crawling with rippers. Most of them have their back turned on us, though, so we can easily take them out with our brand new silenced SMG. We have to find a key so we can open a gate to a ladder, which will take us up to the surface. In terms of sewer sections, this is about as good as one could probably get, mainly because the section only lasts about 10 minutes at most. Once we clear through the army of raiders and the tunnels, we can take our key and head up to the surface where we emerge in a decrepit train room, which is also stuffed with raiders and bug dogs. This area alone is probably the high point of the entire expansion. The train yard itself is also well designed and the music is just fucking great. Seriously, the music in this game is just top-notch. Once we're done clearing out the main warehouse, we can unlock a game to the nuclear waste disposal site. For the next section, we're back to finding mutants, which basically entails us going back to the crowbar extensively. At least until we get into the waste storehouse proper, and it's one of the few places in the entire Ashes saga that has enough residual radiation to be problematic. At the very least, there are still plenty of safe zones where you can let the rads tick down. After some skirmishes with smaller mutants, we can get into this giant arena section where we need to pick up this blue keycard, and obviously this one's a trap. When we try to leave, we get jumped by some greater mutants. Three of them in total. I was lucky enough to get two of them to end fight so I could easily focus on them one at a time, eventually taking out the two while they were still fighting. Once we're done goofing off in the waste tunnels, we can emerge back into the sun for the final stretch of the map. And yes, this was all in one level. 
We can also pick up the final weapon in our arsenal, that being the battle rifle. And it's a unique addition for this expansion. It's effectively the stand-in for the Junker Musket, but it's actually better in every single way. It's accurate enough, has a decently fast fire, and also has a 20-round box magazine. It's also still easily able to one-shot most of the human enemies in the game. The only thing preventing me from using it more is the fact that the ammo is rare and finite. Regardless, once we grab it, we head on over to a motel, which is also filled with rippers, which is to be expected. After we clear it out, we grab the yellow key, get jumped by a truck with even more raiders, and we can finally leave this map. The last map starts with our progress being barred by a gate. We need a blue key, and the guy who has it happens to be a... true patriot. I converse with him for just long enough for him to willingly give the key to us. I even trade with him for a little bit before I swiftly whack him over the head with the crowbar. After we leave that bizarre encounter, we can open the gate and get jumped by what I believe is an infinitely spawning horde of trash jockeys. It would be impossible to kill all these clowns, so we'll just have to book it past them, finally making it to the power plant that we've been after this entire time. And like Baker promised, the place is crawling with rippers. They fully set up here, and the only way we're going to clear them out is if we kill every single one of them. We can rather easily accomplish this by inadvertently blowing up some important machinery, causing the power plant to severely melt down. We have to book it through the power plant, eventually finding our bike in one of the garages, the only problem being that we need a yellow key to exit with it, so we have to go and find it. It just so happens to be in this godforsaken hell room full of hit scanners, which basically acts like a final boss for this expansion. I just save all of my stims and battle rifle ammo for this occasion, so I can just piggyback regen stims for the rest of the map. Once I'm done, I grab the key, hop on my bike, and just narrowly escape the blast range of the power plant. Overall, this expansion was a pretty damn good time, even if it was only around an hour long in content at most. Regardless, with both parts of the episode 1 experience out of the way, we can finally move on to the main event, Afterglow. This is it. The real shit. The one that I've been waiting to cover for the past more than half of this video now at this point. I generally consider the first episode in its expansion to just be a precursor or a prologue to this game, Ash's Afterglow. A mod is so good that it almost acts as a disgrace to call it a mod. Everything, and I mean everything, that episode 1 did, Afterglow expands on. The weapons, the enemies, the story, the maps, the music, everything. It is genuinely one of the best experiences I have ever had playing a game. Bar, very high. If anything you've seen in this video has piqued your interest even slightly, then I highly encourage you to go and play this game. Okay, enough chit-chat though. I'm just gonna jump right into the prologue. Obviously, we'll also be playing on the survival difficulty, as per usual. The prologue starts with us trapped inside the ruins of the spire with nothing but a couple of our things to aid our escape. This just barely acts as a tutorial, but I'm sure the game was expecting most people to already be somewhat familiar with the first episode's mechanics. Once we climb our way out of the wreckage, narrowly avoiding a pipe bomb trap, we walk out onto the surface which is barren and scarred. A shadowy figure stands on the edge of a cliff watching us, and once we turn around, we see a fiery skull racing towards us eventually colliding with a tower. And then we snap back to life, in a bed in the Michonne Station Infirmary, sometime after the events of the first episode. After an indeterminate amount of recovery time later, we find our leading scaver outside a small grocery store. He figured this would be a good claim to get back into the swing of things since he's been out of commission for a while. Besides, he's gonna need some new equipment anyway since he's back down to just his trusty 45 revolver, his crowbar, a duffel bag, and a solar-powered lantern. So basically, we're back to square one again. Regardless, once we actually get to playing, we can get a good feel for our controls, and then grab some armor and a secret right by where we started, as well as grabbing some junk. Junk plays an even more crucial role in this episode, but we'll get to that more in a little bit. Turns out this quaint little storefront is also crawling with raiders, which could be worse. They're nice enough to have our backs on us, so we can easily get some stealth kills grabbing a 9mm autoloader as well as a shotgun in another secret area. I managed to clear out most of the main floor entirely in stealth, which is certainly helpful too. I should probably talk about the secrets on this episode, because they are even more important to your survival in this episode than you'd think. Ammunition and healing supplies were even more scarce early on, meaning that it's important to find as many of these as possible. They can also unlock or uncover new routes and paths through each map. Like this one, where you can jump on this shopping cart after you pushed over to this vending machine where you can jump into this vent, which A, gives us a med kit, and B, gives us another way to approach this encampment of goons. Oh, and before I get to talk about it, this game's soundtrack kicks ass. Just listen to the fucking synth and back in the game, man. It's just unreal. Once we clear out the main store area, we can come to this back warehouse area which has some bug dogs as well as these annoying pricks in the offices overlooking the storeroom, which includes a couple of shotgunners. Once we're done clearing them out, we can get to the manager's office because a fortune of John Merrill with some shotgun shells behind it for some reason. But we can also access the roof where we can find this elaborate secret which requires us to shoot this elevator cable, causing it to snap and fall, revealing an entirely separate building full of bug dogs and all sorts of goodies. Again, these secret areas are ridiculously stacked, so it's a good idea to keep your eyes peeled for them. Once we get back inside, we can find that a previously closed shutter is now open, allowing us to get into a back room, it's an assorted loot, but the raiders are actually one step ahead. They've got a fuck ton of reinforcements at the front of the store, at least a dozen goons and bug dogs included. This is the first map and the game is already throwing giant hordes of enemies at you like this, showing that this episode really ain't fucking around. In the end, though, we peel out and head back down to the subway, bound for Michonne Station. 
after our short adventure in the grocery store, we crawl our way back into the subway tunnels, which acts as the game's first major hub. And yes, most of the game's core content is centered around two separate hubs, with everything from merchants to various different side quests, and a Doom mod made predominantly by three dudes, which is pretty damn impressive. Regardless, after a short jog through some flooded tunnels, we can finally arrive back at Michonne Station. The guard captain is pissed at us for fucking with the spire, which caused more frequent mutant attacks. He gives us less than a day to clear our shit out and leave. Luckily for us, Riggs is still pretty chill. After our extended pit stop here, he's been helping us get our bike back in working order, but there happens to be a slight problem. We're still missing a couple of parts, mainly a fresh tank of gas and a fresh battery. Oh, and do you remember the wall from the previous episode? Well, apparently it got attacked and burned at the ground, which hasn't helped with everyone being on edge lately. Regardless, he says that the best course of action would be to head over to the motorcycle plant in Westside where we might be able to find some more gas. I decided to put that off though because I have a couple more things to take care of before we can head out. Like talking to Violet, the barkeep, who is amiable towards us which is certainly nice. After we're done talking with her though, she asks us for a favor. One of her friends has apparently gone missing and she thinks that something bad may have happened to her. After I agree to help out, I can finally scrape up enough cash to upgrade one of my weapons. That's right, with just 150 bucks in scrap you can craft an upgrade for any of your weapons, excluding the pipe bomb and the crowbar. The first one I choose to upgrade is the revolver, which gives it an extended barrel that increases its damage, effectively turning into a faux hand cannon. Once I upgrade it though, I huff it through the tunnels to the exit that leads to west side, which is the first proper level of this hub. This one is predominantly stocked with human enemies, which is nice since my new upgraded revolver can mostly one-shot them. The first chunk of this map mainly entails us sneaking, or fighting when that gets boring, into this motorcycle showroom, which isn't far from the motorcycle plant itself. Once we clear the joint out, we can head into a small motorcycle auto repair shop where we can finally meet the first new enemy of this episode. That enemy being these 9mm machine pistol raiders who finally complete the lineup of raider types in the game with the two pistol goons, the shotgunners, and finally the SMG guys, or ladies in this case. And yes, you can indeed take that machine pistol when they die, and it's as good as ever, apart from this weird graffiti on the back that I don't really care for. Once we clear the repair shop, we can find the can of gas we came here for, but the level isn't exactly over yet. Sure, we could loop back to the start and head back into the inner city, or we could push on, entering this fight in this bar where we need to take the fuse from the bathroom to power this lift back in the repair shop, allowing us to access another secret. It also opens a door that leads into the actual factory floor, but before I go there, I upgrade my new SMG with a proper silencer. Once we head to the very back of the factory itself, we can pick up a silver security key, which we'll need for later. The game also drops a small gang of raiders on us with the mini-boss in tow. The mini-boss isn't actually too bad, he's just some dingus with two forty-five caliber revolvers. Once we survive the ambush, though, the level is basically over. Only after we see this cool build engine like explosion. Anyways, after we leave, we head back through the tunnels to the exit of the Flooded District. And if you thought the last level was awesome, impressive, and really any other similar term, then, well, you ain't seen nothing yet, let me tell you. The level starts off by pitting you against a platoon of mutants stuffed inside this abandoned mall, which, as the name of the level would imply, is flooded. After we clear out the bottom floor, we can head upstairs into this arcade where we can turn the power back on, and when we do, we get ambushed by another group of mutants. Seems like every step I take towards doing anything important rewards me with mutants. Regardless, we exit out of the mall into the real mutant potatoes this level, that being this flooded street, and goddamn, this is just ridiculously well designed having you fight your way across this flooded city street, jumping over this gap to find your way into a Chinese restaurant where we get jumped by another small army of enemies. Only this time it's raiders instead of mutants. Regardless, once we get out of that, we can escape into the back rooms where we can find this detonator that will blow up some bombs that have been placed in the fast food joint across the street, allowing us to enter the library as well as grabbing the only regen stem in the entire game. The library also has an elaborate secret in it where you have to push all of these switches inside to open up a safe, which is behind a painting, and inside that safe is a duffel bag as well as a copy of Metro 2033, a game that I really ought to play one of these days. But once we leave the library, we can exit into this area with another workbench, which gives me an opportunity to upgrade my 45 gun, giving an extended hammer which allows us to fan fire like a real honest-to-god cowboy. Except the cool ones, you know, he's got a motorcycle. Our next step after that is to enter this parking garage, and we're back to fighting mutants, which means it's crowbar time. Except since it's episode 2, the fights are actually challenging and require a little bit of pre-planning beforehand before we can go bar swinging. I still managed to do this on my first try, though. After we clear out that group, we get introduced to the first new mutant type in the game. That being these big boys who are tanky as fuck and wield these fire speeding crossbows with a projectile that is really damn hard to avoid. A couple of shotgun blasts, and they go down pretty easy, though. After that, we just have to clear out this little art museum, which has a Wolfenstein box art hung up in it like it's fine art for some reason, then we jump into this vent coming out into this laser tag place where the final battle of the map takes place. I think I said place like seven times in that sentence. Once we enter, we get swarmed by an army of mutants, including those new fat boys. I knew the sandwich was coming, so I placed a pipe bomb right outside one of the shutters so I could get some easy, cheap kills when the fight started. After we leave the laser tag place, we can finally find the guy who found us, whose name is Walker. He's a rather cryptic fellow, but he does say that he knows where that guy, that general guy who came out of the spire, yeah, yeah, he knows where he went, the gap. 
and we decide to give chase. The gap is the final proper level of the sub, and it's really good. It's by far the hardest since it hammers you with rads the second you enter. Just being outside is a radiation hazard. Luckily for us, we spend most of this map inside, like in this apartment building here where we can find the switch to raise the gate to the rest of the level. After some more running through various different buildings, we can reach an underground tunnel which is just packed full of mutants. The entire map is, but this place is especially packed. When we emerge back onto the street, we huff it over to the theater where we can fight our first greater mutant. He's not too bad since I got a master blaster and a secret in the flooded district. Oh, I completely forgot. The Master Blaster is this chunky flamethrower slash napalm launcher thing, and it's pretty good. It's effectively a stand-in for the rocket launcher. After we clear the theater out, we can jump into this adjacent apartment building, and if it wasn't obvious by the musical change, something fishy is going on here. In the kitchen, we can find ourselves a pig processing machine. Remember that, it'll come in handy later. More importantly, though, we can find ourselves a fresh battery for our bike. Unfortunately, though, without any way out, we'll have to turn the power on to get out. So we do, and the place is obviously an ambush waiting to happen. Once the power is on, the place fills up with mutants of all shapes and sizes. Thankfully, the game is surprisingly plentiful with ammunition in this fight, and we're finally done clearing the place out. We jump down into this tunnel, and lo and behold... Well, shit. It seems as if getting crushed by several tons of rubble is the equivalent of falling into a pit in a Star Wars movie. You just don't die. The fight itself is fine. You're given ample cover and plenty of ammo beforehand. If you're really strapped for gear, you could just leave without killing him. Regardless of which option you choose to take, you exit out via a tunnel back out into the irradiated sunlight. Before I do anything else, though, I look behind me and head into another tunnel, which leads us into a very familiar tunnel. The one that we took in the previous game to get to the spire. The spire itself is just a piece of rubble, which is to be expected. At least on the surface it is. We can crawl into a vent and enter the base, which is very reminiscent of our dream at the start of the game. The place is empty apart from some corpses. In the back room, we can find ourselves a military rifle. We'll talk about it a bit more later, since we get basically no ammo for it for the first half of this game. We can also find a terminal where we can find a survey desk that will be important later. Regardless, once we leave and grab it, we get jumped by some spooks and I book it out of there. Once we crawl our way back to the service, we can find another apartment building, and eventually we find the General's Camp, which is a bronze security key that we'll need to access another area in this map. That area being this warehouse, which is stuffed full of these trash pouches, you're still as annoying as ever. When we clear them out, we can get into the top offices where we can pick up a gold security key, which is important, since it can be used to unlock previously inaccessible secrets in the other maps in the sub. After I grab it along with this large tub of medicine from this truck, I loop back around and start headed back to the flooded district. Before I go back to the Ender City, I go and talk with Walker, discussing my findings with him. After that, I loop back around into this level's gold security seeker, which has some junk and some more ammo. I also fully upgrade my 9mm machine pistol, giving it a larger magazine size as well as a faster reload speed. Oh, and I upgrade the double barrel, which gives it a third barrel, which increases its burst damage. Then I finally loop back to the Ender City to finish things up. If you take the secondary entrance into the Ender City from the Flooded District, you can find a previously inaccessible area where Violet's friend Porcelain is holed up in. She's been kinda sorta captured by some whack job named Barrett who's been keeping an ungodly horde of mutants down here, waiting to ambush any unlucky sod who finds themselves down there. Fortunately, I've been hoarding ammo and explosives for the better part of an hour at this point, so I am more than adequately prepared. Once we carve a path through Barrett's mutant friends, we can find the man himself holed up in the back rooms. He's packing a double barreled shotgun, which is rather inconvenient since I'm trying to crowbar his ass to get the mostly peaceful outcome. All it what takes is one hefty bonk and then he folds, snapping out of his bizarre delusions. He says it's from the wall, the settlement from the previous episode. Regardless, we send him back to Michonne and then we crawl into the center where we can finally find Porcelain. She agrees to go with us and after taking care of some bug dogs, we part ways, taking different paths back to the station. When we finally get back to the station, I decided to finally turn all the quest items I've been hoarding. Firstly, I go and give a box of ammo primers I found in the Flood District to Riggs, which grants me a discount at the local gun store, which isn't necessarily helpful right now. But after that, though, I head over to the pit fight organizer. If we inquire about placing a bet, we can learn that Mojo, one of the contestants, isn't exactly ready yet. We can go and offer to talk with his manager, and it's that chem merchant guy. He wants to stem for Mojo to tip the odds in his favor, so I finally pull out my secret weapon. You see, back in the gap, I found this piece of C4, which I used on this vault door in the bank. Now, after it exploded, I got inside, and there wasn't anything useful in the vault itself. The real prize, however, was waiting upstairs in the hospital. If you go upstairs and land at this jump, you can get a highly irradiated stem. Now, while we can't use it, Mojo can since he's a mutant. The stem itself is rather unique, being a titan stem. Apparently it was supposed to be some kind of super soldier-esque serum that would grant the user significantly enhanced senses. Regardless, we persuade the chem dealer to let us use it on Mojo, and then we can finally go back and place a bet on him. Since I've played this game an innumerable amount of times, I already know that this thing is basically an instant win, so I place 60 bucks on Mojo. And finally, the fight can commence. Well, shit. At least we get 120 bucks out of that. After that debacle, I head over to Violet and she thanks us for taking care of the whole porcelain thing. 
She rewards us with an empty solar-powered lantern which has a vastly superior battery life than the normal one. Now that is actually quite helpful. Then we can turn in that giant tub of medicine to the dock for some spare cash, which is definitely nice. Finally though, I go and talk with the security captain who has changed his mind on us, at least for a little bit. He's at least mildly more amiable than he was at the start of this adventure. Anyways, after all of that, I finally go back and start working on my bike. I fill up the tank with the gas can that we found in Westside and I plug in the new battery we picked up in the gap. Once I start her up, the thing finally is working once more. After getting our bike in working order, I talk to Riggs and tell him that everything is ready to go, and he offers us another job. That job being to take the briefcase computer to a place called Prosperity, which is just a long drive to the north. He couldn't manage to get the thing working, so he wanted us to take it with us since we're planning on going that direction anyways. Regardless, he gives us the computer as well as giving us a junker mostly for completing all of the quests in this hub. Before I actually leave though, I decide to use all of my junk that I've accumulated to upgrade a bunch of my gear. I immediately upgrade my junker musket two times, which gives it a three round magazine as well as turning it into Baby's first railgun, turning it from a mediocre weapon into one of the best in the mod. I also craft a second upgrade for the sawed off giving it a stock that decreases its burst spread, which is definitely helpful. Anyways, after all of that, I finally decide to pack my things and go. When we talk to Riggs, we can finally get out of town, however, when we finally decide to leave, When we finally finish clearing out the Spooky Boys, we can bid our final goodbyes to both Porcelain and Barrett, and finally we can hop on our bike and leave the city behind for good. This is it. We've got our guns, our bike, and a planned road north that hopefully still exists. This next map mainly just exists as a way to reacquaint us with the vehicle handling in this game, which is just... serviceable. At the very least, the game almost never forces us to make any ridiculously tight turns or force us down any narrow roads, so it's pretty generously open. Once we reach this large drainage gate, we have to hop off our bike and find a way to open it, which leads us into this post office where the bulk of this level's combat takes place. It's good fun, even if a little short. Eventually, after a while, we can reach our objective, that being this switch that opens that drainage gate that I mentioned earlier. After we open it, we can hop back on our bike and ride down to the end of the level, but our progress is halted by another gate. We can talk to a guy over the intercom of this building, and he seems chill enough, even complimenting our bike. Although he does ask some strangely personal questions about us. Wait, who is she? You know what, let's just get this over with quick. I sure hope nothing goes terribly wrong. I got a bad feeling about this. As to be expected, something goes horrifically wrong and we get our ass knocked out. It seems as if the mutants and the raiders have made some kind of a pact specifically to kill our ass which will tell you how much of a threat we are at this point. Anyhow, the mutants get us as well as all of our gear and the raiders get our bike. All of that work to get the thing in working order only for it to be taken from us within the span of a single map. One eternity later. And he is of no further use. No. This one has killed many of our kind. He must serve as an example. Oh man, you just made the worst decision of your life. Welcome to the hockey rink. We've got nothing but 20 health on our trusty crowbar to save us. Oh, and any inventory items that we may have collected up until this point. The game doesn't confiscate those for whatever reason. Thankfully, we're only up against mutants, so a crowbar, a jackhammer, and some backpedaling does the trick just fine. After a couple of waves of mutants, though, we get one that we just can't take down. I mean, I probably could with enough patience, but that's besides the point. Instead of fighting them, we have to scurry off into the vents while being hunted down by cannibals every step of the way. Seriously though, this level absolutely slaps. It's an absolute gauntlet and it shows. The place is absolutely packed with mutants, including a new kind, these shield bastards. They're not as big of a deal as you'd think, especially if you use the new and improved Junker musket which can kill them in one shot. After we're done crawling around in the muck, we get our shit back and then we get into this warehouse and shocker, it's also packed full of mutants. Thankfully, most of them have their backs to us, and we can just easily crowbar them. Eventually, after clearing out the goons in the warehouse, I decide to go loud and clear out the rest of the moons who were waiting to ambush me. Once we clear out the warehouse, we drop down into the fucking sewers. Thankfully, this section is mercifully short, but once we clear it out, we have two options. We could go into the main atrium and clear it out, or we can go into the concession hall and clear that out. I decide to clear out the concession hall first, since the path to get there gives me access to an upgrade workbench where I decide to upgrade my pump-action shotgun and give it a bayonet. The bayonet is actually a really nice addition. Not for combat or anything, though, no, it's damage is kind of garbage, but whenever you use it, you get
get jolted forward a bit, similar to a bayonet charge. So if you combine this with the already fast movement speed, you can reach terminal velocity real quick, which is useful for getting around without a vehicle. Anyways, back to the rink. After clearing out the concessions, so I loop back so I can clear out the main atrium. This fight was definitely the one that I enjoyed more. It's a more visually interesting area, and it's got a more diverse spread of enemies. Either way, after we clear out the atrium, we have to go outside to get a yellow key card, which unlocks another area back inside that lets us get the blue key we need to escape. The outdoor area also lets us loop back to the rink itself, which is pretty cool. And finally, after all of that, after clearing out an entire army of mutant cannibals for this godforsaken shithole, we can leave. Alright, so let's break this situation down. We lost the briefcase computer and our prized bike. We have literally no idea where we are or how long it's been since we got captured. And on top of that, we now have the knowledge that the mutants and the raiders were seemingly working together on an agreement to cap our ass. Damn, the title of this level really didn't lie. In terms of levels, these next few are played back to back as we try to reach the place where Riggs wanted us to take the briefcase computer. This one starts with us running through a construction site, killing none other than, you know, a bunch of fucking mutants. Yeah, for the rest of the game, the raiders take more of a backseat role, and they spend the majority of the next few maps killing mutants. A perfectly reasonable change though, since the mutants were already way more dangerous than the raiders could ever be. After clearing out the construction yard, we travel through some more relatively unremarkable locations, including another one that has a workbench allowing me to fully upgrade the pump action shotgun, giving it a 6 round box magazine which lets it reload way faster than before, or worthy upgrade for sure. After clearing out this museum zoo thing, we can travel through a secret tunnel hidden behind a bookcase, emerging in a small town where the majority of this level takes place. And yes, I know I'm gonna sound like a broken record already, but guess what? There's more mutants! Yay! We can also find this secret area with a mutant named Larry who runs this small meat shop. If we take the right path through the dialogue with him, you can actually convince him to let you trade with him, but since I already had plenty of ammo, I didn't end up buying anything from him. After a while of running around in this derelict city, you'll eventually find the venue where the so-called pain elementals are supposed to play, you know, before the nuclear war happened. Considering these guys' track record in Doom 2, it's a wonder that any of these guys managed to get a following. Regardless, this is where the big climactic showdown of this level takes place, and I have to say, it's pretty damn awesome. I don't know what it is about games that have shooting sections that take place in rock concerts, but they always end up being sick as fuck. Like the one in Left 4 Dead 2, I mean, now that was just peak gaming. After we clear out the backstage area, we can emerge back in the desert and we can seize a set of legendary armor. I think it's supposed to be Max's jacket from Road Warrior, but I'm honestly not sure. In game, it nets you 200 health and armor, basically acting like a megasphere. This lasts me for most of the second hub, but after trekking through some canyons and caves, we come into a large clearing where a guy has been besieged by a gang of raiders, and being the courteous Chad we are, we help the stranger wipe them out. When we go and check on him, he says that his name is Jack, and he's also been heading to Prosperity. He mentioned something about a new guard, and we'll get to know them a little bit more later on. But for right now, though, we leave him to fix his tour bus, and we head through the cave to the place where the raiders came from. Upon closer inspection, it seems like the same place that we got jumped by the mutants back in Escape from Atlanta, so when we finally clear the place out, we can find the prick who tricked us into coming in and getting our ass kicked. He folds almost immediately, and I squeeze him for info. Apparently, these goons sold off our bike to this new raider gang that calls themselves the Roamers. They wanted to join us, so they thought that offering our bike up as tribute would be a nifty idea. They took our bikes somewhere to their camp past the mountains. He mentions that the easiest way to get past the mountain is by hopping on Lucy, who's a bug dog matriarch. She doesn't play a very large role in the story, but she is pretty cool. She can claw and spit and basically all the attacks that a normal bug dog can do. After we saddle up though, we can head over to the array. Walker mentioned this place, saying that the general may have decided to head in this direction after abandoning his camp in the city. And since we're following him, we obviously have to go and check it off our map. After about 15 whole yards, we have to leave Lucy behind and go the rest of the way on foot. Honestly, it's kind of a shame that she doesn't play a big role in the story since she's a pretty cool concept. The way into the array requires us to go through some underground tunnels where we can pick up our only pair of lootable night vision goggles, an item so useless it's actually comical. Literally, I don't think I use these things a single time in the entire game. Regardless, after dicking around in the tunnels for a while, we're spit out into this mine where we have to fight our way up, along with grabbing another one of the game's collectibles, that being a 20-sided Dungeons and Dragons die. The first collectible that I completely skipped over is a plush of the ore girl from Head On, Heden, whatever, who cares. After we grab it, we just have to take this elevator up to the surface, and then, then boom, there we go, we're at the array. When we actually enter the array, the game goes all spooky mode, and I have to say, it's surprisingly effective. After trekking through a seemingly endless network of tunnels, along the way finding a yellow cane and pneumatic car shop air gun, the second to last piece of our homemade weapon that we'll be cooking up, eventually, deep into the base, we can find what seems to be a small war room with a small connected office type area with the terminal and the red keycard that we need for the gate outside. The terminal has some pretty interesting options, mainly an option to crack the survey disc that we picked up all the way back in the ruins of the spire eons ago at this point. 
It has an attached map with the location of a peculiar anomaly listed somewhere in the region. It also has an audio file on it which has someone speaking in a foreign language, seemingly Russian. Once we loop back and head back into the main area, we can hear footsteps coming into the building. We ready our weapons to find ourselves a new enemy, that being these trench coat and gas mask wearing goons with a master blaster. They're probably the most dangerous common enemy in the game, having a ton of health and the ability to throw radioactive grenades that can really fuck you up. After taking care of him though, we can take our ride and head through the gate into the Badlands. So here we are, the Badlands, the second and last hub of the entire game, and it's also my favorite. As much as I love Michonne, there's just so much to do and see here, so it's just an easy win. It also has this funny laser gun, which automatically makes it better than Michonne. Regardless, after I grab the laser gun, I head over to Prosperity. The guard at the gate bars our entry and asks us a couple questions, and we fill him in on the situation. He doesn't exactly buy it, but he still lets us in, directing us to talk with the sheriff. But I decided to put that off for right now, so instead I head over to this mechanic fellow named Patches, and if we give him a couple scrap to fix something, he can offer us a job to clear out the pipeworks, which I take. However, I also decided to go over to the racing stall. The place doesn't do your typical car races. No, instead it does bug dog matriarch races Kentucky Derby style. If the ringleader guy needs a replacement, and for a hundred bucks we can take that slot. The race itself is an absolute slog since the AI can cheat like a Vegas junkie sometimes. But after a couple attempts, I do come out on top. Once we leave, we can go back to the ringleader and claim our rewards. Those rewards mainly only consist of health and armor boosts, as well as this golden skin for our crowbar. It doesn't do anything except look flashy, but I'll take what I can get. After that, I head on over to the other side of town to talk with another scabber named Silver. We shoot the shit for a while, and then I ask about any interesting claims around these parts. If we pester him about the reactor site for long enough, we can get to talk with him in private. He says that a bunch of his buddies ended up going up there and haven't come back. So he wants us to go up there and check in on them, and I oblige. Anyways, after I dick around in town for long enough, I loop back around to the pipeworks entrance so I can A, upgrade my 9mm autoloader with a laser sight, and B, enter the pipeworks and actually start that side quest. The pipeworks themselves are a maze of underground tunnels that link up with multiple different maps in this hub. Apart from this first time, though, we'll be back a couple of times. For right now, though, all we're here to do is clear out some mutants and turn on the pumps for Prosperity's water supply. After we do that, though, I decide to do a little bit more exploring. We can find this locked area, which is filled with cyanide gas, and we'll need something a little bit more protective, like a hazmat suit. Luckily for us, that reactor side that Silver wanted us to clear out will have one for us. After discovering that, I decide to keep going, eventually finding this last piece of our homemade weapon, as well as getting our progress blocked off by some raiders who claim to be members of the Roamers. You could go through and kill all of them, taking the exit into the scrapyard, but that'll get at you a bad ending, so I decide to turn back and head back to Prosperity. After I reach the surface, I head over to the leather worker before I go, since he can actually make some good stuff apart from leather armor. He can craft us a side pouch and a bandolier, items that can individually increase the capacity of one of our ammo types. I decided to get a bandolier first, and the options are 45 caliber, 12 gauge shells, and jusket slugs. I opt for the Jusket Slug since the Junker Musket is really useful and that homemade weapon that I use a single time also uses them. The Bandolier increases our capacity by another 30, bringing us up to 90 in total. A worthy addition indeed. After that though, I hop back on Lucy and ride over to the Reactor Side entrance. The reactor site itself is rather boring, all things considered. Just your standard enemies, at least at first. The first new enemy that you can find are these plant bastards. They're like a piranha plant on legs, which isn't a fun thought. At the very least, they're susceptible to fire, which will be helpful later on. Once you turn the power black on, the place fills up with another new enemy type, and they're a unique one. Now, remember those scavengers that Silver asked us to find? Well, they're here, they've just gone completely nuts. They move around erratically, making weird, unsettling noises, and they attack us on sight. Best way to take him out is the fully charged Jusket Slug, so they can also carry Jeskets and drop a pack of slugs upon death, which is nice so I can farm up a bunch and fill up the bandolier that I just bought. But finally, after trekking across the entire facility, we can find a suit that we came here for in pristine condition. Once we grab it, the area fills up with crazy scavengers who are only a mild inconvenience. Also, I forgot to mention, one of them in an early stage of the level dropped a peculiar item, that being a silver harmonica. After I get back to the start of the level, I can enter into this military checkpoint at the end of the road, and it's got some decent loot and a couple of haunts to go with it. But it also has the fourth plushie, and if you don't want any spoilers on how to get it, then skip to the timestamp up on screen. Trust me, the way you get this one is just absolutely insane. Still here? Alright then, well. So what you have to do is you need to go into this armory here, which is a safe in it. Next to that safe is a red button, and if you press that, it opens a door in another room with an arcade cabinet inside. The arcade cabinet is currently non-functioning, and to get it to function, you have to push this chair all the way into this other room so you can jump onto it, hit into switch, and then finally turn the power back on. And once you're finally able to interact with it... Seriously though, this is actually like really impressive that they managed to pull this off in the DM engine. Sure, the game plays like ass, but it's still cool nonetheless. Eventually though, after killing the final boss and beating the game, the safe in the armory opens up to reveal a Godzilla plushie inside. Another collectible off the list. After I grab it, I head back to the Badlands, saddling up on Lucy. When I finally get back, I finally decide to go over and talk with the sheriff. After telling him that we solved the problem in the pipeworks, he tells us to go and talk with a guy named Kyle. 
when we finally go over and talk with him, he talks of a biodome which could contain the seeds that we need. He also mentions that the place could contain some kind of spore similar to the gas bag spores. He's got a plan that he's not necessarily keen on providing details about until we get him a couple bunches of these spores. There will be plenty spare once we arrive at the dome, so we'll take him up on that deal. For now, at least. The way to get to the dome requires us to use that hazmat suit to get through the area that's been filled in with cyanide gas down in the pipeworks. So after I suit up, I decide to head in. The area doesn't have any enemies, but it does have a time limit. We need to pump out all the gas so we don't die of asphyxiation. This really isn't too bad. Just find the pumps and turn them on. After we clear it out, we can take the train over to the dome. After finally going back up to the surface, we just have to dick around in some caves before finally heading into the biodome. Now this is probably in the running for my favorite map in the game. Now you might be looking at these starting caves and you're probably thinking, oh, it's gonna be some greenhouses and farms and stuff, but you'd be so wrong. Yeah, that one speaks for itself, really. There are a couple different ways to approach this map, but the one I take leads us through some overgrown areas packed with these little plant pods and those bigger plant pleachers from- Plant pleachers? What the fuck am I talking about? And those plant creatures from the nuclear site. There are also even bigger mutated spore creatures poking around, and they're kind of terrifying. At some point, though, you'll start to collect a bunch of spore clusters, which are the thing that Kyle was talking about before. If you're looking carefully, we can leave with all five of the spore clusters, and obviously you know I had to get all of them. Regardless, after a while of mutated plant extermination, you'll come across an area that's filled with some good old-fashioned cannibal muties. It's a rather nice change of pace. They've set up shop and the offices attached to the biodome. And after clearing out the last of the mutants, the plants and the spores, you can finally pick up that package of seeds that we've been looking for this entire time. After that, we just have to crawl our way back into the pipeworks where we can loop back around to the entrance where we exited to the surface, which was nearly half an hour ago at this point. After getting back to Prosperity, we can find Jack, the guy with the bus, is now safe and sound here at Prosperity. He thanks us for the help once again compensating us with some free junk. After heading inside the walls of the building, we can finally talk to Kyle again and give him two punches out of the five that we collected. And just to spoil it now, if I forgot to mention it earlier, Kyle's plan is to poison the town's water supply with the gas bag spores that we gave him. He also wants us to ally with the Roamers, the bastards who took our bike, and I'm not exactly cool with them, so I leave him be for now and I go to talk with the Sheriff. After presenting the packet of seeds that we found to the Sheriff, he'll let us chat with the Baron. The Baron is in Uptown, which is basically the rich boy side of town. It's so exclusive that it's literally been segregated off from the rest of the town. After talking with the Sheriff, we can talk with the guard who stands outside the gate of Uptown, and after telling him that we have an appointment with the Baron, he lets us in. The first thing I do is talk with Wheeler, the guy who Riggs sent us after hours ago at this point when we still had that briefcase computer. For right now, though, I just gave him the video game cartridge which I found in this secret area in the hub. And how did I find that secret area, you might be asking? Well, I talked to Smiley. Yes, the same one from the first episode. Apparently the wall was attacked by a gang of raiders, and most of the people who lived there died. As soon as he got to Prosperity, he was imprisoned by the authorities for some reason. I mean, I can't exactly blame them, he's kind of a shady prick. Regardless, if you pay his $80 bail, you can get the location of a secret stash, which is actually a horrible claim considering the fact that it has complete garbage in it. But, you can find a tunnel nearby that'll take you to a landfill with the game cartridge sitting around guarded by a couple of bug dogs. This is a pretty obvious reference to the E.T. game that came out in the original Atari 2600. It was reportedly so garbage that the company who made it shoveled thousands, if not close to millions of copies of Atari's games and consoles into a landfill in New Mexico. The reference is even more blatant since the game is literally called Homesick Alien. Anyways, though, Wheeler takes it off our hands for some free cash, effectively covering the cash he burned for Smiley's bail. Oh, Smiley's also gone, by the way, so that's unfortunate. But of course, the main guy that we're here to talk to is the Water Baron, who takes the seeds off our hands for some money. But he also has this region's main quest. If you want to get the key to get to the actual gate to where we want to go. Basically, he wants us to destroy the Roamer's main HQ. We'll do this by planting some C4 around various key locations around the base, like ammo storage and fuel silos. Cool, that's great, I'm all for that, but there is one small issue. To plant all of the bombs, we need to get on good terms with the Roamers so we can actually have full access to their base, and I still haven't even gone over the junkyard a single time. Not to mention the fact that our bike is still likely there, so before we wait for the mutant horde to scurry off, I walk over to the junkyard. Also, I had to walk because I sold Lucy off, since if you win the race, you can get around 300 bucks for her, which is an insanely good deal. Normally, it's only about 150. When we finally get to the scrapyard, the goons at the gate bar our entry. The boss is supposed to be looking for scavers, but he wants us to prove ourselves by clearing out a bunker full of mutants. It's not really bad, all things considered. There's a giant vault with a briefcase with the Brigador logo on it, which is a pretty cool reference. Good game. Regardless, after clearing the place out, we can head back to the scrapyard, and their leader finally lets us sense if we've proven our worth. The boss man's name is Garavito, and he's got an offer for us. He wants us to gather information on Prosperity, and if we tell him about Kyle's plan to poison the entire settlement, we can get full access to the base. After getting on good terms with the raiders, I head back to Prosperity and wait. After waiting a couple hours, the Baron sends us off with four pieces of C4. Now we can head back to the scrapyard and take part in some wet work, or dry work in this case, since we're in the desert. The places where we put the bombs are pretty obvious. The first one being these fuel tanks, the second one in this warehouse, the third one is next to this cluster of fuel tanks, and finally this other one is in the hidden warehouse. Now all we need to do is find our bike. 
If we talk with the dog, he can tell us that some dork named Tower has it. When we go to confront him, he's a complete clown. He just rambles on about some shit, saying that we have to fight him in a duel for our bike. The duel thing is also complete bullshit, since he's supported by at least a dozen other raiders on top of that, but even then, he's still pretty easy to take down. After killing him, we can get his red key into the garage where we find our bike. The mechanic named Clyde has made some pretty impressive improvements on it. First, and most importantly, he added two 30 caliber machine guns which can absolutely just shred just about anything, but the only downside being that it uses a rare ammo type that's not used until the last few levels of the game. The next few improvements are rather minor, compared to the machine guns at least. The bike now uses biofuel, which supposedly makes it more fuel efficient, there's also a cool skull mounted on the front, which is pretty neat. Regardless, we take our wheels and ride out of there, and the junkyard blows up behind us. Once we get packed to prosperity, I make the final upgrades on my arsenal, and I might as well go over all of the mods that I missed so far. The 9mm pistol gets a burst fire mod, allowing it to take out smaller enemies with decent ammo efficiency. The military rifle gets a fully automatic fire mode, as well as an underslung pipe bomb launcher, which is now the best way to use pipe bombs as it shoots them in a more predictable arc. The jackhammer, a weapon I've literally never talked about, gets a penetrating blade and biofuel, allowing it to pierce multiple enemies and use way less fuel than it would usually eat up. This makes it surprisingly useful for taking out groups of cannibals easily. The master blaster gets a large tank as well as a special nozzle that makes its flamethrower alternate fire have a further range. I never used this thing much to begin with, but it's still pretty useful in some circumstances. The homemade weapon that we can craft is the Project Pig, and it uses the slugs that we've been hoarding tons of for many levels now. It can be upgraded into this crazy thing that fires salvos of fiery slugs. I don't use it much though until the final boss because everything else can be taken out relatively easy with a normal Jusket slug. And finally, we have the laser gun, which can get a green laser, which only turns the laser thing into a green laser, I know, shocking, but the last upgrade can turn it into this pink death laser thing, which could be helpful, but I literally never used it. And finally, we can go and talk with the Baron again. He gives us a shitload of cash as well as the key to the north gate. He also tells us that we can go over to the armory to pick something up from the quartermaster, that thing being this nice ballistic vest. It doesn't act as traditional armor, but it does provide a decent boost to your base resistance, which is a nice bonus to have. And finally, after all of that, we can take the north gate and head in the direction where the general is hopefully holding up and, oh wait, I actually have to take care of something first. Farewell, whatever your name was, you played a very minor if not negligible part in this entire game. After we waste the stragglers from the roamers, we can head over to the exit. Now, you could just head straight for the Sigma base, but you could also take a detour and head over to the anomaly that was listed on the special map that we got from the array, and I decided to check that place out first. Here we are, Anomaly 210. After climbing through some caves, we can find ourselves looking at a Soviet nuclear submarine named the Philadelphia, in reference to the real-life Philadelphia experiment conspiracy theory, which is a whole other can of worms that I'm not even going to bother going into right now. Regardless, after climbing aboard, the music fades, and we're left with some surprisingly spooky ambience in its wake. Seriously, this stuff can be pretty creepy at times. Okay, just to cut to the chase since this video is already getting a little long, yeah, this place is fucking haunted. These guys are effectively just haunts, but scarier because they speak Russian. Once we reach the end of the sub, we can find ourselves something that'll make this entire endeavor worth our time, however. An honest-to-god Titan stim. We'll make good use of that a little later on. For now, though, I grab it and walk over to this terminal. Once we interact with it, we inadvertently activate the sub's self-destruct measures, and we hightail it out of there, only narrowly escaping the blast range. But after that, though, we can finally leave for the base. As the day turns to night, we continue on the road until we see them, the mutant army, hundreds if not thousands of them closing in on the base. If we're not quick enough, our objective will be swallowed by the mutant horde. The first half of this level is mainly spent on our bike as we navigate the roads, gunning down hordes of mutants with our new 30 caliber machine guns. The game is nice enough to give us plenty of ammunition for these bad boys, so we'll be set for quite a while. There are also plenty of side areas to explore, like this hotel or this bomb shelter which we'll be going back to in a bit, but eventually you'll reach this area where you have to get off so you can grab a silver key to get into the base, and when you do... You get jumped by three of these trench coat clowns and a couple of big mutants and trees across the river. It's not a hard fight per se, especially now with our fully upgraded arsenal. We can't get back up the way we came though, so we'll have to push on and find a way back up. Said way seems me going toe to toe with another army of trash clowns, jackhammer fodder mostly. But once we get inside, on a platform next to the second staircase up, we can bag ourselves the second and final set of legendary armor, which will last me for the rest of the game. After I grab it, I circle back around to the bike on foot, hop back on, and drive to the base. We get ambushed by another giant group of mutants, still just cannon fodder for most of our explosive weapons. After clearing them out, we can finally arrive at the base after a short walk, where we can find that the on-site defenses don't actually fire on us. Seems that we've got a guardian angel on our side. Once we head inside, we can take a comically long elevator ride down where we can get scolded by the general over the intercom. Won't stop me, though. After that, we still have to fight our way through the suckers that made it inside the base. At this point, though, nothing can touch us. Except for nuclear missiles, I suppose we wouldn't survive that. The guy over the intercom says they'll be launched in about 20 minutes, and the ability to cancel that launch will expire in about 15 minutes. 
If we want a chance to stop that thing, we'll have to move quickly. Eventually, though, we'll come across an active terminal with none other than Athena on it. We chat for a while before I ask her if we can speed things up, and so she decides to back herself up onto one of those briefcase computers. After we grab it, we can run into a group of actual new guardsmen who were mentioned by Jack what felt like eons ago at this point. They're the closest thing this government has to a military at this point, and they're still stationed around the base in some areas. They carry military rifles and come in packs, so be careful. After clearing out another army of mutants, we can finally reach the general, and he does have some choice words. Basically, he just says the usual bad guy things. Oh, how did you get in here? Don't trust Athena. She's not what she seems. The, the, the usual dumb shit. After we enter the war room, though, it turns out that the option to cancel the missile launches has expired. But as we approach the Hansel at the end of the room, the final boss is that psychic mutant who jumped us all the way back and kickstarted this entire adventure. Her first phase really isn't that bad, she just flies around and shoots out these purple balls that are pretty easy to avoid. The second phase, though, I'm done playing around. I just pop the Titan stem and spam Turbo Pig until she dies. Shut up. After we cap her, we have to scramble to find a way to delay the launch of the missiles. But if we try to plug in the briefcase computer, then everything shuts down and Athena takes controls of the base's systems. We chat for a while about a couple things, mainly about the war that ended humanity and such. She isn't exactly at liberty to say anything about it, so instead she decides to restart the base's systems and throw that launch back into full gear. She tells us to huff it back to the bomb shelter at the other end of the map that we passed to get here. And before I move on, I, I just have to talk about the music in this part, because it is just fucking incredible. After we finally leave the base, watching the missile launches as we escape, we hop back onto our bike and hop it back over to the bomb shelter. As we enter, the doors fail to close at first, but at the last second, the door closes, safely sealing us inside. And in the end, we're left with the ending vignettes, showing us what happened to all of the people and places that we interacted with. Yes, this game really does go that far. The general just barely managed to escape the blast wave. He's heading north to some uncertain fate now. Michonne's circle thrived, becoming a staging point for various other smaller settlements that cropped up after the blasts. Good for them, everyone there was pretty chill. Porcelain became a prominent scavenger, good for her. Walker is still in the city, even after we offered to let him join us in our adventure. He's got some company, it seems, nonetheless. Barrett formed a new gang called the Ghost Blasters, who sought to exterminate the remainder of the mutant horde who had been killed by the bombs. Despite the constant casualties among their ranks, they're never short on new recruits. After collecting the seeds from the dome, as well as the removing the threat of the roamers, Prosperity thrived, becoming a major trading hub. Eventually, the two halves of the community reunited, leading to general tolerance between everyone who lived there. Prosperity's bug dog breeding economy skyrocketed after we sold our prize Lucy to the rancher. Now people flock to Prosperity, as their dogs are known to be loyal without comparison. The nuclear blast that was caused by the anomalous submarine caused major damage to the surrounding area. Thankfully, the only person who got killed was Smiley, so at least he's out of the way. Larry the cannibal vendor became a more legitimate businessman, and his store became a place where people could go to find valuable old world tech. Some people who entered never left, but I suppose that's life in the zone. Silver left Prosperity, and traveled north, destination unknown. All we know is that wherever he ends up, he's probably going to complain about it. The segment base is lost. The place has been consumed by a thick, radioactive shield. It might be decades before anyone could even safely approach. The remaining missiles are now in the hands of Athena, and there's really no telling what they'll do with them. As for us, the scavenger, well, we were last seen trying to get not roasted by the nuclear hellfire. But of course, your boy is still kicking as the music swells and the camera triumphantly pans over to show us looking off into the sunrise. And so there you have it, the full Ashes saga done in a mostly professional manner. If I haven't already made my stance on these games clearer throughout the rest of this obscenely long video, I think this game kicks ass. In fact, it's probably in my top five of all time. Once again, I strongly encourage you to go and give this game a shot. It's literally free and doesn't require any kind of major setup to dive right into. And if you managed to make it this far, thank you for watching. I really do appreciate you for sticking around and listening to me ramble on about this game for nearly an hour at this point. Anyways, tune in next month when we finish off the Trilogy of Pain.